Let's uh, reconvene and we'll go to item number 8.2, uh, the bylaw 2037-22 land use amendment. Uh, Maria, if you'll summarize that for us, <clears throat> please. <clears throat> Um, oh yeah, okay, sorry, thank you. <laughs> okay, so this is the first reading for bylaw 2037-22, which is a land use amendment um, to redesignate a portion of the southeast of 6, 2014. Um, from agriculture to agriculture general district to residential rural district. Um, the applicant would like to subdivide an approximate three acre parcel from the southeast of 6 2014 for a future residential development. The proposed area is a vacant unirrigated pivot corner. On that quarter section, there are currently two existing rural residential parcels out of the quarter section. The subdivision authority bylaw states that the subdivision authority may approve one um, subdivision on an unsubdivided quarter section of land within the agriculture general land use district and one additional subdivision on the residual parcel. As there are already two parcels out of this quarter section, a land use amendment is required to allow for additional residential subdivisions to be applied for. Um, it is recommended that first reading be given to bylaw 2037-22 to redesignate um, those portions of land shown in the attached map from agriculture general to rural residential. Is this not the right one? Okay. I think you're good. You're good. 8.2. Um, and I think that's, that's all it. for me. Okay, yeah. thanks. <laughs> Thank you. The questions? Yeah, please, Holly. So if I understand right, Maria, it's only been recently approved that you can take two um, developments out of a quarter. That's kind of an, a new development. So this already has two. They want to go to three. How common is this? And how did they get already have two? Uh, that, that's a good question. So um, in the agricultural, agriculture general land use district, two subdivisions could be approved um, without having to do a land use amendment. Um, in this case, those two existing subdivisions are actually already rezoned to rural residential. So the land use amendment um, would change the rules of that parcel of land as to what is um, permitted and discretionary on that parcel. So it removes the um, agricultural designation and, and reduces the ability to do, or I guess it restricts the ability to do anything more than residential <coughs> purposes essentially. So the land use amendment um, pro procedure um, lets the adjacent landowners and affected parties know that this is a potential that's happening. It's no longer going to be used for agriculture. There is probably going to be a subdivision happening along the way and it, it opens the doors for a public hearing so that um, people can speak to it if there are concerns. So, so that's why this happens. Now, it, if council would approve it being a residential parcel, then it would follow the subdivision authority bylaw that this could happen as a subdivision. That, that makes sense. That was a lot of words. <laughs> Thanks, Maria. Another question, Kelly, please. Not a question, if you're ready for a motion. Oh, yeah. Any other questions? Seeing none, yeah, please go ahead. 
I make a motion that we um, approve first reading of bylaw 2037-22. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? All in favor of the motion, please indicate. That's carried, thank you. I'm going to suggest that at this point we move to item 11.1, .1, Administrative Business Potential Resolutions for Foothills Little Bowl Municipal Association. Um, Matt, you want to yeah. take us through that, please? You bet. All right. So uh, Council provided administration with some direction at our last meeting to look into uh, potential resolutions that we could present at the September 16th meeting of Foothills Little Bowl municipal associations. So the two topics were uh, solar de development reclamation funds as well as uh, sunset clauses for conservation easements. So I quickly punted conservation easements to our intern who's way smarter than me and uh, he's got a brief presentation that he'll walk council through um, after I address the solar topic. Um, this was actually the topic of a resolution presented by the MD of Tabor back in 2019. The resolution's active. Um, it was provided in your package for your information. Uh, I'll just read, read it here for you. Therefore, be it resolved that the RMA requests the government of Alberta to direct the AUC to establish a method of ensuring that there is funding in place for abandoned wind and solar energy to be decommissioned and reclaimed in an environmentally responsible way. Um, so that's the res resolution. RMA received their marching orders and they're, they're advocating on that. Um, I included a lot of information, uh, communication back from Alberta Environment and Parks, um, the regulation as well as the directive that currently are in place. Uh, long story short, there's no requirement currently for an operator of a renewable energy operation to provide reclamation security. Um, RMA, RMA continues to, to advocate on this and will uh, keep pushing until they get a hard no or something changes. So that one I think is in motion and there's not much left for us to uh, pursue on, on that front. Uh, but on the topic of conservation easements, because I'm not an expert in that field, we're gonna punt it over to Zachary our intern who did a little bit of research because if you're like me you might want a, a quick crash course on what conservation easements are and what they're intended to do and then we'll pick it up from there. Zachary. Yes please. All right thank you everyone. Uh, yeah so last couple of weeks did a bit of research all over the place in terms of Alberta and conservation easements so this is that will be the topic of the presentation. And so we'll go over the sources that I use, the history of conservation easements, description of it, who's involved, what's its purpose, a note on perpetuity, and the financial benefit. So the sources that I use were this website, um, and all the sentences, or most of the sentences in this presentation come from there. Uh, the website was created by the Environmental Law Center and the Mistakis. This Takis Institute. I also looked at the Alberta Land Stewardship Act, sections 28 to 35. So the history. Alberta created its first conservation easement legislation with amendments to the Alberta Environmental Protection Enhancement Act in 1996. In 2009, those provisions were transferred to the Alberta Land Stewardship Act. Two associations were formed to help organizations using the CE tool in Alberta. Unfortunately, both are now defunct. What survives is the Canadian Land Trust and Standards in Practice, to which most organizations using CEs subscribe. Conservation easements are looked to as a mechanism for private landowners to undertake conservation actions that support the related goals and objectives of regional plans. For the Land Trust Grants Program, the Government of Alberta has also sought to support private land conservation. The province's conservation goals match those of a land trust and landowner. So the, the description, a conservation easement is a device whereby a landowner gives up certain rights and opportunities in order to protect the conservation values of all or part of their land. That interest in the land is granted to an eligible conservation organization or government agency. Conservation easement is typically negotiated in perpetuity and is registered on the title of the land. The landowner retains title 
continues using the land subject to the restrictions in the easement. You're free to sell, gift, or will that property, but the easement binds future landowners to the same land use restrictions. Conservation easement in general, and those land use restrictions in particular, are designed to protect a set of ecological, scenic, and or agricultural values that are cataloged and agreed on at the outset. So who's involved? The Alberta Land Stewardship Act uses the term qualified organization to describe an organization or agency that is eligible to receive a conservation easement from a landowner. There are essentially three types of qualified organizations. There are land trusts, municipalities, and provincial government agencies. The rules and regulations around the use of a CE are the same regardless of the type of qualified organization. Most people are familiar with the land trust in this role. Alberta municipalities, like the County of Newell, are increasingly using this tool. So what is the purpose? Although landowners and conservation groups have a variety of goals, conservation easements may be negotiated in support of only three goals. The allowable purposes are the protection, conservation, and enhancement of one, the environment, two, natural, scenic, or aesthetic values, or three, agricultural land and land for agricultural purposes. There are also a series of sub-purposes that must align with those three, which are recreational use, open space use, environmental education use, and research and scientific studies of natural ecosystems. So note on perpetuity. There is no sunset clause in place for the expiration of seas prescribed in the, in the Act. So as a hybrid document, the detailed co content of the agreement may include a sunset clause without violating the, the legislation. The ALSA does not use the terms perpetual or in perpetuity. According to Section 31 of the Act, conservation easements may be modified or terminated by mutual agreement of the landowner and the qualified organization. As well, provincial, the provincial minister responsible for the conservation easement legislation may modify or terminate the CE if they deem it to be in the public interest to do so. The CE group agreements are created with the intent of holding the long-term and often perpetual conservation values and goals of the original contracting parties intact. And the amendments must support the stated intent and purpose of the, CE, of the CE to maintain its validity. So now the financial benefits to the landowners. So every conservation easement has the potential of a tax or financial benefit. A number of ways the landowner can be compensated for granting conservation easement, which include provision of a tax receipt for a donation, payment for the CE, a split receipt, so inclusion of those two, the first two, or special consideration of a development proposal. Now, open to any questions you may have. Thanks for that, Zachary. Are there questions with regard to the presentation, conservation easement? Go ahead, Holly, and then Lynette. So it only can be terminated if both parties agree. Like let's let's use the situation with ducks. So if ducks doesn't want to terminate, but the new landowner does. They can never terminate. It has to be mutual. That, that's correct. So that's the described in, in the act that both the organize uh, the organization and the landowner must agree to terminate. Um, did you have more? Uh, that's further answer that to that? Or? Yeah, I was also going to say, because this is kind of the interesting part, I think, about the functioning of conservation easements that have been agreed to in perpetuity is, all right, what's the way out? So by mutual agreement, by order of the minister, or by appeal to the Court of Queen's bench. So uh, it would be very sticky if you can't get the mutual agreement to then you have to go approach the minister or go to court of Queen's bench and the act currently as it reads, uh, you're probably only going to see those terms of that conservation agreement uh, change if it's in the public interest for it to do so. So you'd be looking at some kind of development pressure coming up against that conservation easement and that development, what it contributes to the public interest needs to outweigh the conservation uh, benefits or, or the public benefits that come out of the conservation, right? With whether it's recreation, preserving native grassland, ag yeah. kind of a thing, right? Yeah. And so, in, and in fact, maybe the reason that it was instituted in the first place. Yeah, which is kind of where it comes, right? Like it's designed to be a, a sticky thing to get out of. Uh, especially where there's the financial benefits that uh, accrue to the landowner for agreeing to it. 
Um, so that's kind of an interesting uh, area of okay. the agreement, yeah. Thanks, uh, Lynette, please, and then Holly. Well, Matt's last comment is where I was going with that. How much of a financial um, incentive is there that people will actually agree to have a third party telling them what they can do with their land? Yeah. Go ahead, Maria. Um, I spoke to Ducks about this, and they pay 25% of fair market value for um, the land that they put the conservation easement on. Thank you. Holly, you had another question? I was just curious, is the payment always up front or is it a yearly payment? Do we know that? It's probably as negotiated, I would expect, but um, it could be either, I would think. Go I, ahead. I believe with the um, last easement I, that we brought to council, they were paid as a lump sum. Yeah. Um, I, I believe. Most often. Um, and in speaking with Ducks, one of the reasons they discussed um, Council maybe considering doing the waiver was so that they could spend that money while they had it, you know, before they lost it to a different project. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you for that presentation, Zachary. Appreciate that. Good work. Uh, what is our next step here, Matt? You yeah, so I guess that's kind of the question for uh, council. When I started investigating the resolution writing process, I came across the policy that RMA has in place and their pro tips for writing a good resolution. Uh, so some of these things here, you know, history of the issue, the impacts of the issue, um, past or current advocacy efforts, and there hasn't been any that I've been able to find out of the RMA resolution database recent incidents or developments, uh, specific le legislation linkages and other stakeholders with the vested interests. So um, what are the issues that we've encountered? Well, we just see it's happening more frequently, right? So we've had three in this fiscal year alone. Have we had an issue with the perpetuity feature? Well, not per se, but we're trying to get ahead of that potential issue for future councils, right? Um, so I guess what I'd be looking for from council is really direction on where you want to go next. I think it'll be a tall order for us to do the homework on this and have it ready for the September Foothills Little Bow meeting in terms of a, a draft resolution that unpacks uh, conservation easements and the potential impact of a, a sunset clause. So I'd, I'm saying we sit on it for now or if we want to pursue it you know it would be nice to have a couple of counselors and myself to kind of kick this one around with so i do have a recommendation that if we want to pursue drafting a resolution that we get a little committee together we'll do the the heavy lifting uh draft the thing and then bring it back to council and maybe we can be in a position for that january meeting of foothills little bow with something that is uh, potentially a little more persuasive to get our our partners on on side, but uh, you know, for council to consider how big of an issue is this right now, and is this where you want to put uh, put your effort? Any responses, Neil? Uh, in your report, did you say you could negotiate a way out at the start of the easement? Yeah, so there's nothing against, uh, nothing in the act against putting a clause in the contract that would include a sunset clause in it for a particular conservation easement agreement. So that is not uh, out of the question. That, that pretty well solves everything without going it. I mean, if we just enforced that that would be a good tool to have with you, you it would save you a heck of a pile of work of, taking the whole thing apart, because that's the only sticky point that we have a problem with. Go ahead, Matt. I guess the problem with that is uh, we're not party to the agreement, so we've got no power to enforce that. I would, I would say one of our opportunities could be when we're notified of these conservation easement agreements, which are going to be entered into, if council has an interest in a sunset clause, um, we could communicate both with ducks and the landowner that we would highly encourage there to be a sunset clause. Now that's gonna have impacts on the amount of money they get and the tax. So there's, 
some unintended consequences to that. Go ahead, Holly. I would think if one of your motivator, motivations for doing conservation easement is financial, you would not be interested in the sunset clause because as long as you're alive, it suits you, right? You're not probably thinking, worrying about down the road or we have a different perspective. So I would think we'd be more interested than the average landowner might be. My own personal feeling or when the, 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 that brought this has has brought this to my attention is the is the increased amount of land that is being taken. The options for future generations are simply being limited because of somebody on one day decided for perpetuity that whatever the remuneration was uh, to set the land aside. And I think that often it has been uh, in the interest of remuneration and I don't think we can necessarily classify exactly what the percentage of fair market value might have been, but if someone needs needs it, it you know, it, it, 25 percent, if, if that's a number, it, it, well, it's it's not a bad number, but it's not very much money to set <clears throat> to, to say that one person on one day can can decide for perpetuity how land is going to be used. I think that I have no problem with the conservation easement. But short of short of setting a sunset clause on it, you probably won't get charitable or the the conservation groups to come to the table for anything but perpetuity, and then they've got control of that. You you own the land, but they have control of, of what can happen on it. And I, uh, for your lifetime, for a, a set period of time, I have no problem with that. But I think it actually would add value to landowners. Um, potential to negotiate these things if there was a sunset clause on it because think think about that over the last 20 years um, those 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 choices have been sold for very little money and and short of a short of a serious activity um, with with either government or the court of queen's bench those aren't going to be revisited and i i just think why why would we want to why do we want to handcuff our ourselves on that because you know that conservation groups are mostly buying those properties or, or buying those easements with money that is is charitable like they've received a charitable uh, uh, donation for them in the first place plus there's still a tax credit for someone in addition to that so i i just to me it's and i've talked to some people in government who are cons would consider this if they were if they were um, if there was some urgency set to it and also some other councillors landowners in other areas who who see this as adding I, I see it as adding value potential value to agricultural land because if you know there's a sunset they still might come to the table with the same amount of money but it's going to be revisited at some point i just think that's 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 a better position it's not anything that's burning a hole in our saddle but when you look uh, long at some of these things from an agriculture land use perspective i just don't like the idea of of, of people filling in you know in the and i call it a guise it's not necessarily a guise of philanthropy but but in the interest of philanthropy setting taking away the options of of agriculture land for its highest use it, it should be the and it is the landowner's opportunity for for highest use but to to set that aside for future generations i struggle with that i think i think we would do our our um, rural areas a favor by addressing this and it's not going to happen overnight it's going to take government some time to to uh, to process this and 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 there may be conditions that would you know there, there'd have to maybe be a uh, uh, there could be various conditions connected to this, which I don't think we need to exhaust in our discussion of it. Yeah, I agree with, with all of that. But um, like when Culligans were in here, I talked to Ryan afterwards. The people that decide they want this conservation easement on there have made up their minds. And they're insistent that that's what's going to happen. And maybe they see something that we don't, but uh, the only problem I would have is do we really have the right to stop somebody from making their own deal like if you choose to go perpetuity that's your business 
and you've thought it through and very few decisions we make have decisions past our lifetime like when you anything Great. we do we can only control our lifetime so if you have a will and you can state everything in your will that you want you die it goes to court <laughs> you're done right so i don't think thinking we do it in perpetuity is actually realistic in this world I, I, I see a sunset clause as being something that actually is much more realistic of what happens in our world now. Mm -hmm. I actually think with the sunset clause in there, it, it would increase the value of the conservation easement because the organization that is getting both a charitable uh, tax benefit as well as a, you know, sometimes a double tax credit on it. Um, with without without the without the legislation that says it it's going to be sunsetted or reviewed at some point, it will always be in perpetuity because that's the fallback position. And if you're if you're negotiating with somebody who's who's who wants the cash, and let's say it's always a percentage of market value, it's not it's not uh, more than you know it's always a some percentage of market value. So. I think it has potential, but whatever. Go ahead, Kelly, please. Question. So we, we have one in our agenda coming up today, right? Um, is there anything um, in our land use bylaw or anywhere that we can stop that? Like, again, this is a rubber stamping today, right? Am I correct? Yes. Is there any possibility we can put something into our land use bylaw to um, at least protect or to put a sunset clause requirement into these easements or is that provincially or federally governed yeah I don't know that we have the information to answer that question adequately it's a, it's an interesting question and one I don't think we've ever ever contemplated I mean uh, in some of the research into conservation easements, I thought, oh, you know, these would be useful for folks who don't want to see solar going up around them. So they talk to their neighbor landowner and say, hey, why don't you get a conservation easement on that parcel so we don't have to look at the solar panels, right? So there's some interesting ways that conservation easements could be used to advance uh, development interests in the, uh, the municipality, but... <laughs> Yeah, right now, I, the, the items that are coming up on the agenda really are uh, ducks requesting council to waive a, a 60 day uh, waiting period. And that's about all the, the input you have into it. Yeah. I, I think in response to that, I, I wouldn't want to saddle our county with something like that where others around us weren't. I think the, the, the bigger benefit in this is to say, rural land in Alberta is going to be dealt with this that way that we, that, that we just we just think that there needs to be a it's an inappropriate to me it's an inappropriate set aside of, of, a, of a, a list of uses that that what you saw 48 40 years ago certainly certainly doesn't consider where we're at today and I expect the next 40 years will be the same, you know, by an order of magnitude. So, so it, it just seems like a, it, it doesn't seem like wasted time to me. I think it's a good idea to pursue it. It doesn't change any, I mean, it's just some effort to, to raise the issue provincially. Um, and the people I've talked to about it, even in government have not discouraged that. They think it's a good idea, but unless somebody puts it forward, uh, they're lobbied by the conservation groups because they they like to collect other people's money philanthropically and then use it to set aside uh, private land. And I don't say that critically, that's just the way it is. Uh, Holly, please. So shall we go with uh, option one on Matt's um, document? I think that it that's that's a reasonable approach. I think from a timeline perspective, that makes sense to you, doesn't it, Matt? Do you, is that a motion you're making? Yes, it's a motion. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? 
motion is that we basically establish a, a, a couple of counselors to work with the CAO to to uh, prepare a resolution to be presented to Foothills Little Bow Municipal Association and up the ladder from there if there's support, right? All in favor, please indicate. Opposed, that's carried, thank you. I'll help with it if anyone else wants to. Polly? Anyone else? Lynette? Sure, Lynette, Polly, and myself. Are we good with that? Motion to that effect? Ellen? Sure, I'll make that motion for the three members to join that. Okay, all in favor, please indicate. That's carried. Thank you. With that, I'm going to make my exit and turn the meeting over to Councillor Christman. Thank you. We are moving right along. We won't be here too much longer, I don't think. 11 point, oh, that's a jinx, I'm sorry. Um, 11.2, let's go right into this conversation. Maria, okay, thank you. Um, we received notice from Ducks Unlimited Canada of a proposed conservation easement for um, lands uh, north of Bizano, just adjacent to the highway number one. So they're approximately five kilometers north of Bizano. The intention of the conservation easement is to protect wetland habitat and valuable native prairie grassland. Once the conservation easement has been established, it will be registered on the title of the property and no, no development, including the construction of agricultural buildings, cultivation, removal or move, moving of topsoil can occur. The landowner maintains the ability to graze and use the lands for non-invasive agriculture practices. Um, what Ducks is looking for is a uh, signing of a waiver that waves, waves the 60-day notification um, time. Um, by signing that waiver, they can move along with the conservation easement and get it registered on title and complete the transaction with the, the landowner. Um, so it is, staff is recommending that council accept the future conservation easement registration proposed for these lands as information, but not waive the 60 day waiting period. Um, I circulated this to municipal services and I also reviewed the file for any potential development that uh, historical information and there was no um, historical information in regards to development. Um, municipal services did indicate that they may have interest in the land and they would like some time to review this a little bit further, um, which is why staff is recommending not signing the waiver. Um, I think that's all for me. Okay, thanks Maria. It's quite a chunk of land. I. Uh, have it described in my land use bylaw and it's a nice piece of land. Lynette. Why was there a 60 day waiting period in the first place? So opportunity for people to become aware of it. And um, in this case, municipal services would like to do some more homework. So it's, it's just a, an information time. So why ever waive it? It should never be agreed to waiving it. If it's there for a reason, it should stay there. That's okay. Okay. Um, any other questions, comments, or a motion? Holly has a question. I'm just wondering, so that little yellow square, so that one quarter in the middle is not included, it's all the surrounding land. That is so correct. Okay. That is privately owned by another landowner. 
Really? Isn't that interesting? There's a story there. I'll tell you later. I'm sure there is. <laughs> um, I would I would make the motion that we go with option two: acknowledge the future conservation easement registrations information, but do not waive the 60-day waiting period. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none. All in favor of Holly's motion. That is carried. Eleven point. Three, two point two. Okay, carrying on. Oh, we need a motion for each section. Duh. Okay. So same landowner, same um, uh, situation. So do I have a motion? Oh, go ahead, Maria. That's okay. Um, different landowner. Okay. Um, similar situation. In this case, there is a pivot on the property, so the conservation easement will go around the existing irrigated land. So the conservation easement won't be on that portion because it is cultivated, and part of the agreement is that they will leave the native grass or the, the grassland intact. Um, but everything else is essentially the same. We would recommend not, not waiving the 60 days. Okay, thanks. Thank you. I'll make that motion. Option two. Thank you. All in favor of that motion. That is carried. Eleven point four. Two. I'm doing well, aren't I? I don't. I don't use paper often. Um, Eleven point three point one. Pack sale by public auction. Shannon. Hi. Um, all right, so I am here presenting the 2022 tax sale by public auction. Um, each year, the county holds a public auction for properties that are in tax arrears. The uh, process and deadlines are set out by the MGA. It requires a motion from council that sets the time and date um, and the reserve bids. And the reserve bids are uh, set by the senior assessor. <coughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so that's all I have on that. Your recommended action. Yes, sorry. So the recommended action would be to please make a motion to set the date of November 16th, 2022 at 10 a.m. for the uh, values in the Schedule A. Questions? Holly? So being the first time we've done this, I see there's 13 properties. How many of those would you expect to be taxes paid if there's actually going to go to public auction? Like what percentage actually goes through to public auction? Um, maybe one or two I make it through. Um, once we get closer, uh, in September, I, I do mail outs, I make phone calls, I, I really chase people so that we don't go through that, through that process. Um, lots of times mortgage companies will step in too and pay, pay the taxes. So it's just a, a matter of time to go through the process and, and light a fire. Lynette? I'm ready to make the motion that Please. we light the fire. <laughs> okay. As recommended. Any other questions, comments? All in favor of Lynette's motion. That is carried. 11.5. Thanks, Shannon. <laughs> On the way out. <laughs> oh, she's faster than I can move here. Now on to the asset management training and Lane will take us through this. So the county's in the same position that many other municipalities are when it comes to moving ahead with an asset management program. Um, it's a fairly new initiative that municipalities are required to participate in and there's an oppor <clears throat> opportunity for the county to join with the cohort group that 
would allow us to um, share experiences and kind of go through the training process together. This is being sponsored by RMA and by um, the former AUMA. And there is a motion that's required by council if there's an interest in participating in this. We would like to move ahead with it. And we're just here to ask council to approve a motion confirming that you support the county's participation in this cohort training program. Thank you. I had a question. Um, how many do you think you would be sending for training? It's probably going to be one, two. Okay. Yeah, it, it, there's going to be limited to the number that would actually be involved. Thanks. Holly. I was going to make the uh, motion that we accept option one, but my question is, what does IAMA stand for? I know RMA and AUMA, but what's IMA? Infrastructure Asset Management, Alberta. Okay. Any other questions? All in favor of Holly's motion. Good to go. Carried. Thank you. Let's carry on to councillor payment sheets. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, Todd's here all day, so we'll bring him in. <laughs> um, let's let's take a look at our councillor payment sheets or not, because you know that's my favorite subject. Eleven point five. Any comments or a motion to approve as presented? Lynette, you move to I'll make the motion to approve. Okay. All in favor of the motion? That's carried with thanks to the comp committee for persevering through that. Mm -hmm. Requests for function of council. Um, can you use your mic? I know we did the compensation for June. Do we have to do the uh, motions for expense reimbursement and adjustments from council compensation sheets too under 11.5? I just figured that they would be together. Oh, okay. Okay. Usually they're one, but if you want to separate them, we can. Okay, thank you. All right, Todd's here. What's that? I think we'll take Todd while he's here. Then we're not holding him up. Okay. Yeah, true. When I saw you, I thought, okay, let's do 10.1. All right. Let's do it. Excited to be here. Thank you for having me in the room today. Yeah. It is uh, much, I don't know what it sounds like for you guys, uh, but when we talk into the computer, it's very echoey. It like comes back at us. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to concentrate on what you're saying when you're listening to what you just said. And uh, so this is much nicer for me. So thank you for yeah. allowing me to come down. Uh, but just a quick update, I guess, on where we kind of are at with some programming. Uh, so roadside mowing, we're really finishing uh, probably in the next week and a half, two weeks on our first pass, which is kind of exciting. Uh, I did a little driving in the north uh, this week, taking some pictures, and uh, it'll be nice to see some of that tall roadside grass be gone and then a little bit safer driving for the general public. Um, we did uh, finish our river walk program uh, last week. Uh, super excited with how it went. Um, the, the typical reason why we've been doing this program for the last... Uh, well, forever, I think, um, was for Sentless Chamomile, um, and really the population seemed to ebb and flow, but the Sentless Chamomile is way down. We have a significant population of common tansy, and if you've ever looked in that little book that I gave you guys last time, you'll know what all these wonderful weeds are. That one, yeah. Uh, common tansy, yellow toad flax. Uh, we have a, a few uh, new spots of leafy spurge, which is a little discouraging because we really don't want leafy spurge in this county. Um, some black henbane, uh, just some, some of the other, other ones. Uh, so we do some great picking and spraying. 
Um, and just as an aside, because I love this story, the one day the crew came back and, and we have some wonderful new staff and they said, man, we got three bags of chamomile today. And I was thinking back to the days when I used to do it, I'm like, that used to be like 20 minutes. Like we used to fill bags. We, we did, uh, I think it was almost five tons one year. I'd have to go back and look. But anyways, three bags is a really good day. Um, club root and bacterial ring rot surveys are complete, so that's good. We're moving into Fusarium graminearum, which is on wheat. Uh, so we should be doing, I think there's eight fields we, uh, we want to complete, which is not a very uh, onerous task. And then grasshoppers, we count for the provincial government. So we have, I think there's 46 locations. Uh, we do the roadside uh, count and then just inside the field. Uh, just for the, there's four different types of grasshoppers that we, we look for and count their populations so they can update the uh, infestation maps. We did, uh, we've had Kim doing some road top spraying and kind of just the right, just the edge of the road uh, in the south. Uh, some very significant kochia populations that are really driving us nuts. Um, it just, kochia is a bugger. It, uh, it moves in the winds in the, in the winter time and um, it just seems like it deposits anywhere where there's an opportunity for it to grow and then the roadside edge is where it's growing. So he's out doing that and I think he's doing a really good job. Uh, we're kind of excited. The drills are moving already. Uh, that means guys are putting in some winter crops uh, and that's very encouraging for uh, the soil erosion conversation. I'm um, so excited about that. The hamlet and subdivision mowing is an entire battle this year. We went from nothing to we're still behind and this doesn't make any sense. Usually by this time of the year, we're not behind. We are in fact way ahead. Um, so we're hoping that uh, this pass will get us in, in the good books and then we'll maybe have one more early September to kind of close the season off. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's unreal. We've never been so behind on Hamlet uh, mowing before. We do start losing some staff, which really compounds things. Um, the, they sometimes like to take some vacation just before they go back to school and, and, and we love it and we love them for it, but uh, that makes our life uh, difficult. Mm -hmm. And then the, uh, the VMTs are hitting some thistles and milkweed patches. Primarily we start on the areas we didn't do with the roadside sprayers. So if you guys are in the south, you'll see us burning around in the one ton trucks. There's a lot of walking involved, uh, sometimes six or eight miles at a time. And, uh, if they weren't in shape before, they are definitely going to be in shape after that because 30 degrees and walking is, is a great time. And then Emerson, I got to tell you, what a wonderful season we've had. It's been uh, up and down, lots of weekends, very busy. Um, during the week, it kind of quiets down. So then our uh, supervisors get a little bit of a reprieve. And uh, we just started uh, gearing up everything. We we're hoping shortly after the long weekend to start the final construction for our upgrades down there. So hoping to be in and out and done by kind of the beginning of October so that we have a couple weeks to clean up the grounds and maybe get some grass seeded before the winter arrives, hmm. which we know is going to happen on November 15th and the snow is going to stay the entirety of the winter and it's going to be wonderful. That's, that's my life goals. Thanks, Todd. Yes, Adina. Just want to know how it's going with the snakes and Emerson. Really good. <laughs> so I think I, I probably mentioned to you guys last time we were in council that they were doing some training on uh, proper snake removal. And uh, you'll never believe it. The lady left, she came down, she did her training and she had a, a, another thing to do in the afternoon. So anyways, she buggers off. They finish up the meeting. They're uh, literally cleaning up the stuff, closing up, gonna you know, go on about their day. And here's a bull snake in the, uh, uh, what's that thing? Yeah, the camp shelter. And <laughs> just like, what are the chances? I can't even talk about it. I hate it. Um, so they got to practice. So 15 people got to practice on a live snake and they said it was awesome. Um, <laughs> there's pictures of it <laughs> and it, it was great. Uh, but it is good to get some opportunity. And I mean, what a wonderful opportunity to do it on a bull snake because they're relatively harmless, I, I think. That's what I tell myself. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but yeah, no, I think, uh, as far as I know, we haven't had any more sightings. I happened to be down there meeting with a contractor last week and talked to Richard and Faye and they hadn't had any more encounters. So, oh, please don't. Did the one under the outhouse move or is it oh, still the, hanging out? Sorry, I thought you said move one to my house. <laughs> yeah, the one, the one under the outhouse, um, 
it has historically been a bull snake and she's a wonderful big beautiful snake and I think it's the same one because it looks like it's about eight feet long so I assume to get to be an eight foot long snake it takes some time so we're guessing that it's she just comes back and does her normal thing we filled in the hole before when they leave and then she she finds it, it just goes underneath the corner and probably hides in the shade kind of thing so Todd, is the bull snake a breed and not a sex? Because you keep calling her. It's a breed. What's that? She probably has a name too. I wanted to know what Todd had named um, her. <laughs> Common Tansy, Scentless Chamomile. What's her name? Yeah. Okay. I don't know if I could tell you what I've named her <laughs> in this room, but no, it's, we've actually. Uh, it's such a weird thing. Snakes are so uh, intriguing, and I never really grew up with them being from Manitoba. I mean, we had garter snakes, but you run over those with a lawnmower and they're gone. Mm -hmm. um, but bull snakes and rattlesnakes are just so, they're big and thick. And uh, the one year we were doing a cleanup in May at Emerson, which we thought was really early to see a big bull snake, we watched it take a rabbit. And it was insane. We could hear the rabbit just screeching from all the way across the ball diamond. So we're like, oh my God, what's going on with this rabbit, right? So we rip over there and yep, that bull snake had it and it was done for. It was crazy. Okay, so Todd. I could talk about it. Yeah, sorry. We're counselors and we charge $4,000 an hour for therapy. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> All we're, right. It's a beautiful place and the snakes are harmless. And yes. uh, Jennifer from Alberta Park says, if we leave them alone, they will leave us alone. And also if you're out walking about and stuff, she tells us that the snakes will move away because they feel your vibrations and they don't like you. Okay. So anyways, Good. those are the words I'm living on. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Thanks for that riveting report. No. All right. Let's uh, bring Mark up. Twelve point two. It's not a hard act to follow at all. <laughs> We're serious in my department. That one has all the fun. <laughs> no. Uh, for my report to council, uh, you can see officers have been duty busy doing their duty in uh, the various areas. Uh, campgrounds obviously continue to keep them busy. Um, fleet services continues to go. Um, under review and stuff and they're, they're implementing a lot of things to uh, make things a lot better in that area. Uh, parts inventory and uh, how we conduct our repairs and, and servicing business in a way are, are being looked at and uh, how we're actually organized down in the shop. So uh, some duly noted efforts down there to make improvements by myself. Uh, greater operators, they've uh, completed approximately 4,800 kilometers of road grading. Um, truck drivers, we're definitely beyond 20% of the gravel program now and uh, maintenance operators continue to keep up with everything else. Dust of pavement program went uh, extremely well. We did have a couple of rain delays, uh, lots of questions from yourselves, a few questions from rate payers about why is my dust abatement so dark this year. Uh, I will reiterate again, a lot of the areas that received a gravel treatment prior to dust abatement, the gravel came from the gem or the ballast pit. It has a coal residue in it um, and it does make it look darker. In cases it can look just about as dark as asphalt. So that's generally the color difference in, in what you're seeing on treated roads. The gravel has not been pre-treated with dust abatement. It is just how it is when it comes out of that pit. Um, what else have we got? We've got, uh, finally took receipt of our new triaxle gravel pup trailer. Um, just like everything else on uh, supply orders and stuff like that, they're all subject to um, different things being held up in the chain of um, processing. So. And Rosemary Greater Storage Compound is under design and we're hoping to have that one tendered out here in August. So with all of our greater sites, uh, previously we did not have any uh, security fencing or things like that. They're all getting security fencing. We have bulk fuel tanks at those locations. That is generally a target, particularly when price of fuel is high. So that security fencing acts as a deterrent and that's uh, about what it is. So. 
Uh, we're doing that at all of our locations and um, just with this, uh, we decided to switch up to uh, the Rosemary area from uh, where we were originally going to go this year. So we sh and I think we've only got one left after this. Engineering the Kinbrook Connection Pathway Partnership Stage 1, the pathway from this building south, the 2.4 kilometers more or less to Township Road 18-2. Uh, you have that tender uh, ward hopefully coming up following my report and uh, the other 10 kilometers remains in design phase and discussion phase for us to resolve the final details on all of that and uh, continued promotion and, and encouragement of public support towards that 10 kilometers is ongoing. CNWP phase two land ownership signing meetings uh, for the easements that need to be re-signed and stuff to access land to tie in neighbors and whatnot for those that signed up is underway. And uh, contractor pre-qualification was advertised with 10 contractors submitting interest. Uh, the review of those contractors is, is taking pl uh, place. And um, then we're uh, hopefully getting into a position where we can tender our first contract out here in uh, mid to late August with uh, award following in September. Um, part of the supply chain and whatnot, we did uh, discuss and, and decide that we would put together a quotation um, to invited suppliers, three invited suppliers meeting our purchasing policy um, for us to purchase pipe in advance based on the engineer design because pipe supply was going to become an issue as the uh, pipe suppliers did indicate to us. So that's why we chose this course of action so that there weren't any unknown or, or delays uh, that uh, were unexpected in the uh, work. So that uh, award has taken place and, and pipe is now in production phase. CNWP phase, uh, well, CNWP phase, CNWP refund checks are being issued as applications are received. I think there were only three or four of them as of um, just this past week or so, and uh, we'll deal with them as they come in. Tilly landfill closure, we continue to learn more on that file, uh, working with our engineers, journey engineering on that, and uh, we'll be making progress as soon as we get those matters wrapped up that are historic in nature. Crack sealing program of paved roads is complete. I know there had been some issues from the public brought forward that um, a, a blotting agent was not used on the crack sealant. So blotting agent is generally something to pre that prevents the traction of that crack sealant from getting on tires and, and, and not staying in place. Generally it's done with uh, just cement paste, you buy the dry cement paste or you can use a uh, blotting agent of water and some dish soap basically. So. Uh, that didn't happen. We did have a new contractor in this year. It got uh, dealt with as immediately as we found out, but uh, there are some other um, matters that we're dealing with. One recent complaint just this week. I don't know why it was an extended time frame to identify it, but it'll get dealt with uh, through the contract. Uh, additionally, line painting. Uh, I don't know about this one because Jeff is um, on vacation, but line painting is expected to commence here in August. I don't know where we're at with that acknowledgement of that, though, with our contractor. Something a little bit new for, for councillors, I don't think we've ever talked about Texas gates, but Texas gates on our road allowances, uh, maintained roads and stuff do need agreements through our department. We've been in this process for a number of years now, tracking down the owners of Texas gates. We are in our final round. We are sending out our final letters and if adjacent landowners do not accept responsibility for them, they will be receiving notification of when the gate is coming out. Um, and then therefore anybody that thinks they're just gonna free range graze is, is not, they're gonna have to fence their property. So, or go through the process of getting a Texas gate agreement and installing it to uh, county standards. So if you hear anything from any of your rate payers on Texas gate agreements, uh, Russ Seidel is leading the charge on that one. This is just what's going on. And I looked at it as it could be something that hits your plates. Why are they trying to rip out my Texas gate? If somebody says that to you, you say, why haven't you accepted it as being yours then? Go sign the agreement, it'll be yours, it'll stay in place. Uh, otherwise, they're coming out because they're not necessary and nobody's taking care of them and they present a hazard to the motoring public. School bus stop ahead signs. Um, we don't advertise these things very much or very well in a way. It's just one of those things that uh, we do have available to the public where you have school age children that are being picked up on buses. Um, there are terms and conditions behind these and 
we are aligning ourselves with those conditions of Alberta transportation. They consider sight lines and stopping distances and all these sorts of things before they will allow somebody to have a school bus stop ahead sign. If you live on a straight of way, I don't know how many times that bus stops on Highway 873 between here and Dutchess. But if you say that your road on the gravel road and you're the only resident on the road and it's a problem, I'm going to find it very difficult to give you one on a straight away when the school bus stops multiple times on a highway where there's much more traffic generated. Mm -hmm. So we're going to align ourselves with those standards. We're going to do that with a lot of our things in the future because we are an extension of the provincial government. We may have unique situations that we have to deal with ourselves, but we want the conditions to be similar. So just if any of that hits your radar um, through the coffee shop or a phone call that is what we're attempting to do if you need some more information please reach out to us municipal development plan rewrite uh, kicked off as uh, each of you sat in for that that were present and uh, we had steering committee following councillor engagement on that and uh, we're just working uh, a continuing administrative assistant uh, cross training between municipal services and fleet services so we can get that uh, knowledge base transferred and also try to get through processes and procedures to find some um, improvements where we can lean things out so other than that the um, permit report is attached to the back and i'll answer any questions of council Thanks, Mark. Helen has a question. Mark, are you currently primarily in the Rosemary area for drainage projects? That's where the EID is focused right now. So we are wrapping up the last, what do we got? Two miles-ish, I guess, um, up in the north part on phase one. And we only had half a mile, which included two landowners that, part, that are partaking in phase two. So we strive to get about 35 kilometers roadside drainage and EID main drains rehabilitated every year. And we're down to uh, 800 meters. So my go forward uh, thought on this that I've been uh, verbal with the EID on is um, based on this year's response, even last year's response with uh, reluctancy on landowners, I think we call a meeting for the last uh, three, four phases that we've got, um, call them all together at the end of uh, harvest season here. We find out whether it's um, a yes or no on a ballot box or, or whatever where it's discreet. We just count it up at the end after everybody's left and if there's very little interest, I, I think we need to refocus our efforts somewhere else and get out of Rosemary. But with that, I'll remind council, and maybe some of you aren't 100% aware, Rosemary is like the largest area for overland flooding of county roads and private land impact, but uh, the landowners are not that receptive to the program. So um, my message is just simply going to be that if there's a lack of interest, let's see where the interest actually lies and get there. Any other questions from our colleagues? For phase one of the Kinbrook pathway, you only had one tender that came forward. So I know it's going to be discussed, but I'm going to ask anyway right here. How are you to know if that's actually a, a good price if you have anything to compare it to? Well, we did have three parties show up for the contractor um, pre-tender pre meeting. Uh, one of them was AECON, another company out of Calgary, and AECON usually competes with Brooks Asphalt and Agriot around here. Uh, it was a uh, minute, uh, last, last minute decision of them part, they, they acknowledged that they would not be submitting a bid. The only thing that I can tell you is that they're below the engineer's estimate and that's based on some of the local pricing that was done in advance of the project and, uh, and then sometimes we can look at other projects uh, throughout where they're taking place to say that it's, that it's good. Um, according to policy, we put it out for uh, advertisement Alberta purchasing connection so any and all contractors had the right to bid on it and this is what we got. Okay. We need a motion for both municipal services reports that's Coles and Marks. If there's no further questions do we have a motion? Greg I saw your hand first. I'll make that motion for both. Okay. All in favor of Greg's motion. 
That's carried. Thank you, Mark. Now we're on to your next item. Okay, so stage one of the Pathway Partnership Project, um, July 26, 2020, tender closed for stage one of the Pathway construction. Three interested uh, construction companies attended a contractor meeting held on site July 14th. One tender submission received. Uh, McElhaney has provided the tender summary and recommendation of award uh, attached to this package. You can see the recommendation that uh, we do recommend County Council award the Kinbrook Connection P Pathway Partnership and, and County Pathway Stage 1 uh, from the County Administration Building to Township Road 18-2, construction to Brooks, Brooks Asphalt and Agar in the amount of 473470 and I'll gladly answer any questions Council may have. Anyone? Motion? Adina. I'd like to make the motion that we go with option one to uh, award the contract to Brooks Asphalt. Thank you. Any further comments? All in favor of Adina's motion. That is carried. If I may, and to go back earlier in the day, the reason why I came into the room previously when you were discussing the um, Brooks gun range and stuff is because the pathway came up. I can uh, advise council that safety review had been done on construction of the pathway. I'd also like to remind council that we have an adjacent road that we're only like seven meters off the road surface. So whether it's a pedestrian or whether it's a motorist, I, I don't know what the concern is because the road's been there for 30, 40 years. Um, so just to reassure you, we've, we've done safety review and, and audit on those things and uh, see no reason with it. We've had to work with all the utility companies with the siting of the pathway as well. So it's in a spot that uh, we believe all the risk has been uh, mitigated and managed and uh, we'll continue to uh, uphold, uphold that standard anyway, so. Great. Just a quick question on the pathway. Um, does it go between the two, between the, the fence lines? The pathway or is it on the one side or so so you probably would have seen that there's a new fence being erected on your way to the office today at least that is correct uh it will be between the two fence lines uh with the exception that the uh existing fence line closest to the road will be coming down um in the construction process any other questions Looks like you're good to go, Mark. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 11.6, back to functions of council. Are there, yes, Greg? So I have one here that um, I believe Neil and I, um, it affects, uh, it's the 55 plus Alberta Games Committee. Um, we're taking this as an extension of the uh, Brooks Parks um, Committee. I don't know if this is, uh, we are paying money for this and it is uh, uh, good to have uh, Newell County representation on this committee. So I don't know if we need to have a permission for a function of council on this or, or not. I, I thought maybe I should bring it up anyway. Good question. Mm -hmm. It's always good to have the conversation beforehand. And so this came out of your Brooks Recreation Board, right? Yeah, it involves the uh, Brooks Parks Board. I don't call it recreation anymore. Uh, Brooks Parks Board and the, oh. um, and the Joint Services. So it's kind of a cross between the two. Mm -hmm. And we haven't had joint services meeting for a while, so it hasn't come up there, but. Okay, so if, if you're willing participants, use your mic, okay? Neil, put your mic on. Yeah. Yeah, this 55 plus thing is a, it's a big deal. Yeah. Uh, we'll have to do something, I'm not sure what, but they'll be begging for volunteers. 
And uh, there is, just to let you know, we did have one meeting on August 4th. Um, it was virtual. And then on August 17th here, we're going to, I'm going on a site visit uh, for the facilities in Brooks and in the county that may fit. Uh, just to note that um, Brooks and County of Newell are putting money towards this. Uh, I believe none of the other communities in the area uh, that would be Duchess, Rosemary, and Bizano have put any uh, cash in. So, you know, it is it is one of those things. Um, and I don't know if any of their facilities out in the municipalities will work due to maybe in Duchess, but not so much maybe Bizano because the the drive uh, and it being a seniors games. So we'll, we'll find out more on August 17th as to where we're at with that. Do I have a motion to appoint? Adina? I'll make that a motion to make that a function of council. Okay. All in favor of the motion? That's carried. That could be quite involved for a time period, hey? Yep. Yeah. Thanks for that commitment. Um, going down to 13, 14, 14 one payment register. These are information items. Are there any questions on the payment register? Holly, you're disappointing. <laughs> I, my my neck totally went to the right to the left. <laughs> okay. okay. Good. All right. Um, anything else in the information that you want to ask a question about or discuss? Okay, Holly. Now, I don't know where I read this because now I can't remember. But Matt, somewhere in here in the financials, there was a, something about, I'm assuming it's the Rolling Hills Cemetery. Um, and it said it was a motion. It said RH Cemetery. So I'm assuming it's Rolling Hills Cemetery. And it was a motion. I think it was prior to our council because I don't remember a cemetery any coming up. Can you explain that? Yeah, I think uh, that's going to be on the explanations of why certain budget lines are over budget. Um, so. If I just find it here, I believe that's related to a motion uh, purchasing a little strip of land alongside the uh, Rolling Hill Cemetery there for, for the road access. I thought maybe Page six of 44 in that uh, information package towards the, uh, the bottom there, note six, council motion C. Mm -hmm. 17720, so back in 2020, approved acquisition of Rolling Hills Cemetery Co land with funding from the infrastructure fund. So, so these explanations that you see here, this is, uh, you know, us making sure we're complying with MGA requirements that any spending has been contemplated in the budget by separate resolution of council or is legally required to be paid. So if you see a budget line that's overexpended, you should expect some accountability back in terms of why that's that's over. That's why we provide this here. Holly, did the county buy the cemetery? No, just uh, a portion of the, the land by the, the road going to it. The land just wasn't used? It was just a little piece? Well, Mark could speak to the, the specifics, but uh, that access road going in, there's just a little bit of land there that was uh, was purchased, not much. I don't remember the conversation, so I can't help you. Just odd for buying cemeteries, that's one to know. Yeah, not, not plot. Not. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, benefits, he's from some little plot. Okay. Um, any other questions for, on information items? Do we have the in-camera today? Any items for in-camera? Okay. Anybody else? Holly? 
Just one very quick thing from the Palace Economic Partnership. You guys all saw Quentin on the screen. I think it was a month ago giving his update. Quentin has resigned from PEP and is moving on to a job um, in Edmonton, living in Invermere, working out of Edmonton now. Um, so uh, one of the, um, the first vice president um, from Foremost has taken on the role temporarily while we sort it out what we're gonna do next. Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're at the end of our agenda. Ariana, satisfied too? All right, a motion to adjourn. Holly, Neil, yeah, all in favor? It's carried. <laughs>